good evening. We'll give it just a moment for those attending by Zoom for that to populate, and then we'll get started. Are we allowed to turn our videos back on, Mr. Heyer? Turn what on? The videos. Our videos on Zoom? They're on. What do you mean? Okay. Well, my, mine wasn't. We don't, we don't. Does it put, matter? We don't put videos on. Oh, it doesn't? Maybe I just like to see my own. I mean, it doesn't matter? If you, if you would like to be featured oh. for the whole meeting, I'm, I'm all for it. I'm used to having all the faces. It doesn't matter? Can you speak? Yeah, okay. All right, we'll call the meeting to order and begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mrs. McLean, may I have a roll call, please? Yes. Mrs. Crane? Here. Mrs. Egan? Here. Ms. Catalina? Here. Mrs. McGinnis? Here. Mr. Heyer? Here. Mr. Need? Here. Mrs. Horst? Here. This meeting is a meeting of the Board of Education in public for the purpose of conducting the school district's business and is not to be considered a public community hearing. There is time for public participation as indicated on the agenda in items three and nine. Item two is approval of the consent agenda. May I have a motion, please? I move that the Board of Education approves the consent agenda as presented. Support. Are there any questions or discussion on the consent agenda tonight? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. Item three is citizens request to address the board. You are given two opportunities to address the board. Under item 3.1, you can request to address the board on any topic that's on tonight's agenda. Under item nine, you are welcome to address the board on any topic. When making comments or asking questions, please state your name and direct your comments to Mrs. Kelly Horst, President, Clarkson Board of Education. If there are any uh, audience members or members attending by Zoom, who wish to indicate their interest in addressing the board on any topic that's on tonight's agenda, now is the time to do so. You just need to click on the participants button and then the raise hand feature. So I'll give you just a minute to do that. And as you can see, the agenda is on the screen tonight. We have two presentation items, one on our equity plan, our COVID funding plan, and three approvals, personnel changes, an agreement with T-Mobile and the superintendent contract, plus our monthly finance report. I am scrolling through our attendees this evening and I do not see anyone that is indicating their interest in addressing the board on any agenda items at this time. I always confirm with Mrs. McLean. Okay. Then we will move on to our superintendent update, but you will always have an opportunity to address the board again at item nine. Dr. Ryan. Thank you, President Horse. Uh, this update kind of uh, goes from one spectrum to the other and I'll start with uh, to me everything I always look in a way with our school district is in the form of hope and possibility and combination right now completely tempered with appreciation and I have to put out uh, my sincerest thanks and, and continued gratitude to the employees teachers custodians bus drivers principals parapros counselors social workers and everyone affiliated to Clarkson no. Schools over the last month, I have to tell you that as we have seen uh, incidences uh, in our community where COVID has increased in Southeast Michigan and Michigan, and we follow that along the news, uh, our employees have done an amazing job, been Clarkston true when it comes to trying to do their absolute best to give a really solid experience for our students in the safest environment that we can provide. And going from classroom to classroom, I can tell you our teachers are living it one day at a time 
to bring that best effort. And every day they recommit, and I just have nothing but gratitude, and I feel as their superintendent kind of a sense of ought to be part of the organization that makes this possible. So I want the board in our community, those listening in to hear it. If you haven't had an opportunity to thank a teacher or custodian or bus driver, anyone that touches the lives of your children, I encourage you to reach out. You know, simple just, hey, are you okay? Hang in there. We see what you're doing, I think, makes a world of difference. And to that end, for our individuals out there, and for those of you who read my Friday update, you know that we believe that we have hit a peak in working with the Oakland County Health Department. And obviously, there's never any guarantees because the virus doesn't ask us for its path. Uh, but it has been fairly consistent throughout this year, and we're seeing kind of a peak over the last two weeks and starting to see a downward trend, which in combination with an increased number of individuals being vaccinated daily in Oakland County and in Clarkston, I'm hopeful that we're going to be able to finish strong for the remainder of the school year. Uh, but it's not without uh, immediate struggle. Right now in our secondary buildings, we're pushing in the realm of about 30% or one out of three of our students is out on quarantine, quarantine at any one moment. That's huge. And we need to continue to, to be able to manage because that's our, one of our best defenses to have it spread within our buildings, which I might also add, we've not, again, seen any major transmission patterns within our buildings. These are all the items that as your superintendent look to advise that we stay in our in-person format and we finish strong that give the line of credibility and I feel like the data that supports it right now um, but I just don't want to leave that sense of appreciation um, secondly looking along the terms of tonight and being able to share an equity plan which is going to transform Clarkston over the next five years I don't want it to be lost in everything else that we're doing right now and all the other struggles that we are kind of in a unique moment of time. Um, as I've been um, sharing with our community and our board over the last 18 months to two years, we've been doing some very uh, in-depth self-examination as a school district looking at the elements that make up all parts of our program and the opportunities for all kids in Clarkston. And I've shared with our community that there's a lot of work to do district-wide to make sure everybody has that promise of all the opportunities that Clarkson can bring to bear. And tonight, uh, the presentation by Ms. Mahoney is going to give that first and really solid move of plans that were really uh, originated that we wanted to do for this school year uh, from last spring. And with COVID and all the other things that we were struggling with, it obviously wasn't a time to kind of uh, un unfold that. As all everybody remembers, not only did we have struggles of keeping our buildings open, but the financial crisis of last year that never fully materialized in terms of schools was alive and well as we were looking at tightening our belt even more. Uh, in the midst of all that and through COVID, things have happened. One, we've never given up the dream of what we wanted to accomplish with our equity plans, of making that dream of all Clarkson kids having that high level of, of success and opportunity in Clarkston. But we also looked at the impact of COVID over the last year, and we know that uh, students and groups that um, before might have not experienced the full, full benefit of Clarkston were even less likely to be successful this past year as part of our distance and online learning. We know that uh, elements of our community, we know socioeconomic status, we know race, we know all the elements that we need to be monitoring to make sure everybody gets that fair shake in Clarkston and gets those opportunities. And now, 12 months later, we're ready to springboard forward. And I'm so excited, not only for the potential of what we can do for the kids long term, but I'm also looking at what we can do short term because equity matters and the supports and the research-based um, things that we're gonna put into place work anytime, but especially for students that might have been more seriously affected either academically or socially emotional by this pandemic. So to me and our team, it's not simply good enough to close that gap that was created over COVID. We want to surge forward. We want to use this as a springboard based on resources that the federal and state government has provided us, that you'll hear a little bit about those buckets tonight. We're going to use that as our initial capital to really get off the ground all the things that we really dreamed about doing. Uh, it's going to be absolutely incredible and tonight you get to hear some of the more details. Um, over the last week and a half I had the opportunity to address our entire elementary division about our plans with respect to equity and then building by building do stopovers to hear feedback from teachers and I'm still in the process of getting through buildings again of what their dreams and hopes are related to this. So I think we, nothing but to me blue skies ahead and I think 
the old adage about never wasting a crisis or never take when you get knocked down as being permanent. This is where we get up. This is where we show the world what we can do. And I, for one, in speaking from our team, we're so excited about that springboard forward. So I can tell you at the depth of the amazing amount of effort right now by everybody in these struggling times, there's no better time to look to the future to find that energy and find that excitement because this is when you need it most. And I'm so excited to be part of a team that's at forward thinking as we push into next year. And I know that our Board of Education has directed me from last summer and last spring that this is really what we wanted to focus on. And I'm so excited to be able to bring it to bear this evening. So I just want to put that in everybody's consciousness. And I think that also goes to say that in Clarkston, while I'm superintendent and I'm working with this board, I can speak for all of us that we want to look out to make sure no students are left behind in Clarkston. You come here, you're part of the family, and it doesn't matter your economics, your race, your religion, or anything else. You're going to be part of our team, you're going to be part of the family, we're going to stick up and see you, and we're going to make sure you get what you need to be part of what it's going to be for that Clarkson experience. And obviously it starts in elementary, but gosh, how exciting it will be as we see those successful classes move through onto graduation and out into the world. So I apologize for being a little long-winded tonight, and, but if you can't tell, I'm, I, I'm very deeply passionate about this work, and I feel like for once as a superintendent, all of us can look at that point in your life where you had the right instrument at the right time, with the right resources, with the right focus, with the right team to do amazing things. And I can tell our community we're on that cusp right now. So as you hear that presentation tonight, dream with me as we get ready to move into the future. Thank you. Well, let's not wait another minute. Let's roll right into our presentation items. And I think you transitioned that very nicely. We'll let Mrs. Mahoney come up to the microphone and take us through it. Good evening, Board of Education. Uh, that was uh, quite an introduction by Dr. Ryan. I'm equally excited just to dig into this plan with you and how it serves all the children of Clarkson Community Schools. To start off, I'd like to look at the subtitle of post-COVID. Um, it is very exciting that we can start thinking about teaching and learning beyond COVID, and that brings energy right to this plan. This is a five-year plan. And this is a projection in this plan we want to remain fluid, assessing along the way what's working, what's not working, and what adjustments need to be made within this five year. It is an investment plan. And I just want to say that we are investing in the students and children of Clarkston. We're making movement for every single child, as Dr. Ryan um, explained, and again, this is just um, super exciting. I think in the past, um, as I've been an educator for quite some time here as a teacher, an administrator, and now in central office, that we've made very good decisions around equality. We have a very strong instructional practice in Clarkston. We have high quality teachers. We have high quality programming. And that is nowhere near in question tonight as I lay out this equity plan. But I think we need to move past equality and start looking at equity. We have looked at data and we've shared that with you um, in the past prior to COVID where we looked at certain subgroups that really need strong attention and support structures. And that's what I'd like to lay out um, tonight. So goals, we have two goals around this equity plan. The first is academic achievement, all kids achieving and being successful in academics. The first is a two-year expectation. I'm going to share some data with you, but what in, within our two-year expectation or plan, we want to bridge that gap from COVID. We know that COVID um, landed quick and we had to make quick adjustments. We turned around and went one-to-one -one technology and we know that there were challenges within that learning arena. Distance learning, face-to-face, -face. we had to toggle, even Clarkston Virtual. We had to make instructional adjustments within some strict safety protocols. We've talked about kids in isolation, kids in quarantine. 
and some of our students have had to go into those phases more than once. Just the idea of being behind a mask provided challenges within our learning. And of course, family challenges. We know that every family has had a story around COVID. And so we want to move past and build in supports. Part B there says a five-year expectation. This is the foundation that we desire for long-term equity for all of our students. This is a high focus on elementary and achievement for all. All buildings succeeding. All children succeeding. Special ed education students we've looked at, our students of color, culture, and students living in poverty. These are students that we want to address with higher supports in Clarkston. Our second is social emotional supports. We have built in some interventionists just to support the social emotional learning for our students. And I know we've brought this forward is the therapy dogs and we're already making movement on that and we believe that's going to impact our kids. This is no cost and it's one dog per building. So I wanted to start off with some data and we've looked at this before. This is 2019 MSTEP data around ELA. Our district average then was 58%. And we can assume based on COVID that our performance has dropped. We are now in MSTEP for 2021. And again, we're assuming that these percentages have dropped. I just want to state again that this is no reflection on teachers as we look at how students are performing. This is our subgroups, and I think we want to draw attention. There's some things I want to point out here, and one is Pine Knob. At a glance, it looks like Pine Knob is doing very well. But again, when we dove into the subgroups, we have a strong special ed population there. We have students of color and we have social emotional needs. And so there's things that we want to address at Pine Knob to help students succeed. I also want to look at North Sash Elementary. Our free and reduced lunch is very strong in this building. We have students that are Hispanic. We have students in poverty in this building. And again, we want to add supports there. And at Andersonville, it's the same with subgroups. We've looked strongly students in poverty, students with social emotional needs there. And again, we want to address that. The second slide is also MSTEP data. And you'll see similarities there. The district average there is 57%. And again, you'll see this variance in terms of how kids are succeeding with buildings. The next slide, Heidi, is local data. So this is our assessments and this is based on a screener. Three of our elementaries um, used iReady where the others did remain in STAR but you will see the yellow which is current and again just emphasizing the drop due to COVID. So the yellow average there was 62 percent back in 2019 our average was 66 percent and again you'll see a decline in performance there. And the last is the same. It is our local data according to math. District average this year 65% in 2019, 73. M Mrs. Mahoney? Yes. B before we leave that slide, I guess the, my, my one takeaway on that is you know, obviously this is one data point, but I, I look at it in that it seems like the the buildings and areas that you just ran through that have the highest needs probably have the worst fall off. Is that a, is that a fair takeaway? I mean, we, we've kind of said all along as a board that, you know, we, we, we feel like the kids that are <clears throat> disadvantaged going in are affected by this pandemic even more so, and it would seem like this data you know supports that and i'm i asked the question and pause for a second on this point because I, I i think that and i want to make sure it's just not confirmation bias that i'm looking for that 
And I would agree. I do want to uh, also say that these three buildings did lift up a different screener of iReady based on instructional supports, but still there is a significant drop. Mrs. Mahoney, do we have any attendance information for this year versus last year in those buildings? For instance, maybe some of those families aren't as comfortable with some technology, so they weren't getting um, the real lesson out of, you know, the teachable moments that they needed. I mean, do we have any data that, just, you know, and we have we have anecdotal data. We we can look at attendance data, but yes, the stories were vibrant in terms of the struggles with technology, as I outlined a little bit around COVID and the challenges that occurred. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So moving on, I want to talk about the implementation of this equity plan. We'd like to begin this fall of 2021 for the school year 2021-22. I want to highlight that I've grouped these for reasons. At the elementary level, number one is our highest priority school, and that is North Sashaba Elementary. In terms of the needs that the data is showing us and the strongest attention that we want to give in terms of support structures. The second is Andersonville and Pine Knob Elementaries. Again, these are title buildings, and the data is showing that there is a need there, that again, we wanna build supports in place. And we have struggling students in the four non-title buildings, Bailey Lake, Clarkston L, Independence, and Springfield Plains. And so you will see added support structures in those buildings as well. At the secondary, we're very excited to propose a secondary literacy coach for the entire division. It's a big undertaking, but it is movement to address the literacy support at the secondary level. So they, this person will support all four of our secondary buildings. So I'd like to begin with North Sashaba Elementary with the addition of five teachers. I'm gonna start with the right, which is this table or chart. And as we focus on literacy alone, we want to keep our current literacy coach. We're going to move Erin Kuhn to focus on lower L, and we want to hire one additional literacy coach that will service upper elementary. We also want to add two certified teachers that will act as interventionists, and this will be a lower L focus and an upper L focus. And I just want to define a little bit the difference between a coach and an interventionist. We've had literacy coaches in the district and they have served our district very well. And these coaches coach teachers. They lead teachers, they provide professional learning for teachers, they model what good instruction looks like, they facilitate data meetings around data for best instructional practice, they lead teachers. The interventionist is going to work with tier two. These are interventions for students that are struggling in the classroom and a certified teacher will lead that. Based on assessment, they can make teacher moves in the moment to best support the learning of our kids. This is hands-on kids attention. We're very excited to have certified teachers leading this work. In addition, to aid support. In math, we want to keep our current math coaches. We are very excited that we hired two math coaches at semester. We want to keep them. We have an upper and a lower L math coach, and then we want to add two certified teachers that will act again as interventionists for upper and lower. On the left, we just want to remain committed to lower class sizes at North Sash. We really want to focus on high effective teachers as we have, as we look at hiring teachers that can build relationships, teachers that have good classroom management and are very strong in their instructional delivery. We want to add an adult aid for social emotional interventionists there. We want to look at building guest teachers because it's very important as we look at this team of coaches and interventionists that we meet and we look at the data, we see what's working, what's not working, what adjustments need to be made. We want to meet often 
And so we're going to need guest teachers to help support those teachers if we pull them out of the classroom just to talk about data. And usually this is around grade level PLC teams. Additional field trips, very important. We know that shared experiences promote talk. And when we talk, it increases vocabulary. And that is a need that we see at North Sash. Preschool program is something we're very excited about, looking at educating kids prior to entering school. And we'd like to look at that seriously for the 2022-23 school year. We started an outstanding after-school programming um, just this, this current spring. We want to continue that at North Sash. We want to look at summer programming, stemming off an excellent plan that we have in place for this summer. Professional learning for our ELL population. This will be very important at North Sash. And then also family engagement. How can we partner and collaborate with our families to lift up literacy so that as one united team, we can continue to grow. This comes out of the LEO project that we're working with Oakland schools, and we'll continue that high focused at North Sash. Our next school is Andersonville Elementary. We want to add seven teachers. So again, focusing on the right literacy, we want to keep our current literacy coach. We want to add two certified teachers that will act as interventionists. Again, lower and upper L. For math, we want to hire two math coaches. And we also want two certified teachers that will act as interventionists. We also want to add one social emotional interventionist. This is hands on for kids to support and grow social emotional learning. At Andersonville, we want to stay committed to low class sizes. We want to look at after school programming. Again, as I spoke to North Sash plan, this is we started this, we can continue this at Andersonville. Additional field trips very much needed. Building guest teachers to support team meetings around data. And again, lifting up the work that we started in the LEO project, and that is family engagement. Our third is Pine Knob Elementary. For literacy, we want to keep our current literacy coach. We want to add two literacy interventionists. For math, we want to add one math coach along with two math interventionists. And we want to add one social emotional interventionist at Pine Knob. We are committed to low class sizes. We are posting for two equity and inclusion coordinators. And we believe the elementary person we want to work with, with a focus at Pine Knob. Our black students are underperforming. And we want to focus in terms of how we can grow and help our students. After school programming, very important. Again, coming to the table to look at our data to see what's working and what's not. We need building guest teachers to support our team meetings. And again, the LEO project lifting up family engagement to collaborate with our families. Our non-title buildings, this is a total of 13 teachers. <coughs> we want to keep our current literacy coaches at Bailey Lake, Clarkson L, and SPE. In the spring, we did interview for the literacy coach at IE. And due to financial cuts, we were not able to hire that teacher, although she was selected. And now we're bringing her on board. And I'd like to celebrate Julie Chamberlain as the new literacy coach at Independence Elementary. And we also want to hire one literacy interventionist per building. And it's the same plan for math. We want to add one coach and one interventionist per building. And as you'll see and reflect in the entire elementary division, every school might look a little different. I know our non-title does not, but our titles did. And that plan was based on the data that we saw within our subgroups. And then I'm very excited to propose a secondary literacy coach. As you know, we presented the whole movement um, with ELA and math at Sashabaugh Middle School. 
and I would like this coach to really support differentiated instruction, not only to the entire division, but also for ELA 6, to start off strong. How can we use the ELA 6 curriculum within ELA 6? Is to make sure that all kids are receiving high quality instruction. And I also want to look at reading interventions. I think this is a need at the secondary level, and what can we do to support reading at Sashbaugh Middle School, the junior high, and the high school, as well as Renaissance High School. So the evaluation, again, going back to this five-year plan, and how does academic achievement look like in two years? We hope to get back to our 2019 data. That's our reach within the first two years, is to come back to what that data looked like. And the five-year expectation, our data, our data will indicate strong similarities among all our elementary buildings. And at a glance, if we go back to data and look at those blue pillars, we just hope they look aligned. That is our goal, that all kids are succeeding in Clarkston Elementary. Not one school outshines another. This is what equity is about, that it brings up all kids. In our social-emotional supports, we're going to look at referrals. What does the behavior look like in our buildings? How are the check-ins going? What are the student plans and supports? And we believe, after five years, that number one and number two are going to work. This is an investment. And as we look at the last slide, I put fireworks. Because this is a big bang for our kids. And I know it's a lot of money, but it's worth every, every dollar. I've been in education a long time, and I've never seen a plan like this. I feel like sometimes I get a little emotional about what we can do for kids with this plan. It's incredible. It's a win. And I'm confident that we will make movement in Clarkston. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mrs. Mahoney. There's a lot of information here, and uh, I know we have this listed as a presentation tonight, but I think it's probably a good time for us to just take some time and discuss and ask a lot of questions, and I know I was jotting several down, so um, I'll just open the floor, and whoever wants to start, just indicate. Mr. Heyer. I'll start. Okay. In no particular order, and I'm sorry, like, this is really awkward with you, like, behind me, so uh, I... I know, I'm I, sorry. I apologize. It just feels weird to get yelled at for not speaking to my microphone and trying to address I know. I, I wish I could come up with a better solution. Stefan and I have tried, and I apologize. Maybe we could get a microphone here or something. I don't know. Anyway, we, we'll deal with it. We tried that. We really did. I, in, in no particular order, um, I would say, number one, like we're guilty in the education field of using lingo. So I think as we talk about this and we roll this out, like we use buzzwords all the time, and like equity is hot right now. I don't think that's gonna resonate with our community and I think we need to make sure that we realize that. And as ambassadors, the, the seven of us and our entire administrative team are going to have to communicate what we're doing here. And on the surface, if you're John Q, random parent who cares about your kids and you live in Clarkston, um, what we're doing here is gonna seem odd, right? If you did not come along in all the conversations that we've had that Dr. Ryan has referenced for the last few years and looking at subgroup data, if you just jump on the train and realize, whoa, why are, why are we spending all this money on these coaches and extra teachers? Like, it's, it's gonna seem an only certain buildings that maybe my kid is not at. Like, that's gonna seem odd, and I think that's a terminology communication issue more than it is anything else. I mean, I fully support what we're doing, but I'm on the train, and I've been on the train. And so I think that that's really important. And I think along those lines, we love to aggregate data in the education field, right? We just rolled up the whole building into one little bar and one little line, and, and there's 400 kids in one building and 350 in another and 550 in another building, right? And, and when you're talking subgroups, you, I mean, you're really talking individual kids, right? And I think for us as a board, as we communicate on this, like just maybe getting a little more granular in terms of the data that we have access to of 
how many kids are we really talking about that we're going to service at Pine Knob and North Sash and, you know, even at Bailey Lake and, and Springfield Plains? And, you know, what, what are those numbers of kids that we know, like, we're really targeting this specific number of kids, right? And, like, what I don't, I mean, and, and I, John, John knows, you know, staffing numbers. Um, you, you, you could probably just roll them out exactly how many sections we have and, and uh, how many teachers we have, like, like seven teachers at a given building compared to how many total, um, I think is important to understand given how many kids are at that building and how many kids we're specifically targeting. And like I'm talking about for us, you know, as I have a grocery, well, I don't know, there are not really any grocery store conversations these days, but maybe a bus stop conversation of talking about, hey, what are we doing here? You know, when school starts and we're more in person, just understanding, hey, we've got 220 kids at this building and we really need to go after those 220 kids and this is how we're doing it. You know, like so, some of those kind of concrete, you know, pieces I think would really be important because I mean, I think this is this is awesome and I think what you what you ended with uh, Mrs. Mahoney about the the data when you said in 5 years we we want to see this, like I would love to be bold and 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 make some data predictions. You know, and it, it, it's okay if, if we don't nail them, but, but really, like, if we can execute this, and, and I think, I mean, we'll hear from the rest of the board, but I think as a board, based on all our previous conversations, like, we're all in. We execute this, get it up and running here for the, for the fall, I think, is when we start. Um, wh what does that five-year data point look like? What does the 10-year data point look like? And, and I look at this like, what, we're going to save so much money in terms of things that we won't have to do for these kids because we've gotten to them early and we really focused on them we've kept them out of all these really expensive things that you know maybe they they've been in now um, collectively and so th that's kind of exciting and I think you know a couple points of um, early childhood like I, I love those pieces I, I wonder is that enough could we do more um, you know getting them early on is is preschool early enough are there ways to even target earlier? You know, is there, you, you mentioned Dr. Ryan about the Clarkston family, when does that start? You know, if you're, if you're born in Clarkston, how do we get to you as soon as possible? What does that look like? And how do we onboard you into our Clarkston family, you know, kind of right away, you know, what, whatever that really, uh, really looks like. And so I think, you know, as we look at this, you know, I, I wondered, we're adding all these things. What could we lose? What could we take out? And I think, you know, cert certainly some of the, you know, we talk about interventions and some of the tier two, and, and there's even more intense interventions beyond that. You know, the, the whole point is we'll have less of those is, is the hope, right? And so we will be able to lose some things through this process or that, that's probably a poor way to say it, but we won't have to invest in those items as much as we do now because we're investing in the prevention, you know, early. And I think it's really, you know, having, you mentioned being in education a while, right? I've been sitting in, in one of these seats for a while now, like what, what happens is we go through cycles, right? We had teachers in what we called non-load bearing positions in the past and things happen and we don't anymore. And now we're, we look at data, right? And I guess it's really important to say, everything you presented tonight is, is data-based, right? We didn't just come up with this, right? I know we've had conversations for years now that if we wanna really move the needle on, on having our kids come along and, and perform as good as they can and achieve their dreams, um, whether that's you know, test scores or going into something that they're very passionate about, this is the way to do it. Right, it's, 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 there's a lot of things we have access to, but there's other places where this has worked and we're using that data to say, we can make it work here. I think that's a really important um, point to make. And so I'm, I'm excited for this. And what I, what I um, will end on is just, I wouldn't wanna see us get five years in and then something happens and we, we bail on our plan because we need to make cuts and class sizes and extra teachers and right, our money is in personnel. Um, so how do, we, how do we stay the course? And I think really predicting and measuring on those data elements is, is the way that if, if all of us are new in five years or 
10 years, you know, how do we look back and say, all right, we've got to stay the course because this really worked. What those people five or 10 years ago put in place really mattered. Um, that, that, that's where my head is at of saying, let's look at some of the, the numbers at this level and, and kind of preserve that because I certainly know, I don't think any of us are planning on being here forever. So um, let's, let's put something in place that really has some longevity to it. And, and I'll end on a note of saying, this is really exciting. I did not uh, run for the Board of Education so we could talk about quarantines and switching students and uh, all the stuff we've been dealing with for the last year. We've done our very best and it's great to help families and students in our community. But this, I think, is absolutely a long-term plan. You know, I'm sorry it was delayed a little bit because of COVID, but I feel like our plan is stronger and more exciting than ever. So I, I'm, I'm on the train and I look forward to uh, getting over the finish line and implementation and then monitoring along the way. Um, before we move on to others, Dr. Ryan, I wonder if you wanted to give our community who, to Mr. Hire's point, may, you know, may not have had the benefit of some of the conversations that we've had, certainly starting about 15, 16 months ago, of some of your experiences, particularly in your doctoral program, I think, and where you really developed your expertise and, and your passion, as you expressed earlier, for, for this philosophy and for this approach and maybe just reiterate kind of some of the context of, of how we got to this point and, and sort of the, the basis for this approach. Sure. Uh, you know, looking at where it kind of presented itself as a doctoral project, I mean, Clarkson is a beautiful community. And when you start to pull back the covers and look at each one of our schools, they're all individual little communities within a bigger community. And I think the mistakes of the past, you know, we have had things like academic, academic development specialists. We've had on different support positions over the history of Clarkston. But where we kind of failed to meet the rubber in the road work was that we never looked at the individual, we looked at good ideas and how to implement those good ideas universally. We never looked at it from the perspective of what do we need first? And then how do we meet that need? And that we have to look at each of those beautiful communities, each of those elementary schools. They're not better or worse, they're different. And they have different needs. And to be successful as a school district, a board and a superintendent, we go really far by just recognizing that they're different. It sounds like a very small detail, but it's something we haven't done over the last 50 years here. And we've been content to kind of provide a solid program for anybody who's able to, to, to reach out for it. They're successful, no matter what school you go to. The program is high caliber all the way. The beauty in what we're doing right now is each of those sites, if you saw each of those buildings have different plans, that's part of the recipe for success. Having a district focus that is not willing to accept anything less than excellence along the entire uh, district is another huge piece for success. And actually looking at the, the long-term investment, as Mr. Heyer said, is another piece of that recipe for success. I mean, the good news, folks, is that this has been done countless times across the country in schools that all they have is schools that struggle. They don't even have a mixture and they find a way to overcome that to bring excellence to their communities. So we're already halfway there in a lot of ways and right now just that consciousness that we have to do things differently. That's why I'm not, no, no educational jargon at all. Not one size fits all. And when we actually look at what those needs of each of the sites are and then meet those needs with research-based things. We know when we looked at subgroups last spring, and we gave you a, kind of a 10,000 or maybe a 30,000 foot uh, par view for the presentation this night, th this evening, and I would immediately like to say in an upcoming meeting, it would be great to get another workshop where we could kind of dig back in the, into those subgroups. Our principals know their populations. They are individual kids. They have names. And these students' names, as we group and see how successful they are within our program, paint the picture for themselves. And all we have to do is listen. And once we listen and focus on how we divide our resources to make, make things work and are committed to do it. Again, time's an important thing. Unfortunately, as many of our school board members know when they go to state conferences and maybe even national, everything is usually broken into a school year. We're gonna try this in the fall and suddenly we're gonna measure some sort of success in the spring. I'm here to tell you that for school districts and schools around the country that it works, that's not the time frame. 
you have to, it's a much longer term investment that needs to be consistently um, shepherded. And unfortunately, the average turnover in administrations in the state of Michigan is 2.8 years. When it takes five years to get anywhere, you automatically see when you have successive layers of lack of understanding of the beauty of individual schools and what their needs are and an overall change in focus, we wonder in education across the state why we're not more successful. I'll tell you, it's, it's pretty clear. And, and I wish I would have said my doctoral work would have been to, you know, I, I developed and uncovered the perfect recipe, you know, and I created it myself. No, like I said, thousands and thousands of times over, schools have found that recipe. And the interesting thing is you just can't simply read a journal or go to a seminar and bring it back to your house and say, yep, this is what we're going to do, team, and it's going to work. you gotta got to have that beautiful balance between understanding what the needs are in your community, in your schools, and what the best practices you need to kind of weave with them to get success. And then you got to stick with it. So I really appreciate Mr. Hire's comments, respect, hopefully that kind of covers some ground in, in those areas, and then we're going to keep going after it that way. And people might wonder, why in five years are you trying to make sure that the 2019 average is met by all buildings in your district? And why don't we even want further? Absolutely, longer term, we want to go further. But if you were to aggregate that data and do it in comparison to just Oakland County, which is arguably one of the highest performing counties in the state of Michigan, that puts us right at the top of the, of the, the bucket. You know, It's not always about trying to get the top to go even higher, which we will, because in this, plan, all buildings are being invested in. All buildings we, we expect to see increases. But the way we're doing it here, you're going to actually see it to where making sure everybody has an opportunity has a lot of power. So thank you. For thank you, Dr. Ryan. It, and I think, Dr. Ryan, along those lines, like our, our collective goal is really simple, right? We want every kid to show at least a year's worth of growth in a year, right? I mean, that's so simple, right? But it's so hard when you look at how many different kids we have and where they come from and what their backgrounds are, what they have going on in their lives and what they bring to school with them um, that, that gets in the way, right? And, and that's, that's what we're trying to affect. And we're not saying some kids don't get that year because they're already far ahead. We're saying everybody should get at least a year, right? right. And let's continue to move along. And like, that's exciting, right? When we can say, all right, you, you're not quite making the year. Let's do some extra things for you. And I know everything we've talked about with literacy, especially, and We've kind of moved on to math, you know, I mean, that, that's really exciting when we can get that granular. You know, I got 24 kids in my class, but I know exactly where each one of them is and what each one of them needs. And I mean, that's, that's amazing to think, you know, a teacher with, with some of the technology and the help that we have can get that level of detail. That's awesome. And our teachers are so excited about the potential of it. You know, they, they see it. They've been wanting this. And I know not, we have very degrees of experience in the board. I know not one of you can remember ever having a district plan that really addressed the differences. We've always known it, right? We've known there's been differences, but we've never really taken the bull by the horns and said we're gonna change it and do something about it. That's, what, that's why I get so excited with this. I think this is very exciting in addition because teachers aren't so low, right? In terms of teaching and, and with expectations with kids. They're now part of a stronger team and not only are they going to see, receive the support, but our kids and the conversation, it's going to be with interventionists, with coaches, with subject area coordinators, even our principals. We're all surrounding kids together for stronger success. Mr. Neiden. <coughs> Thank you, President Norris. I'm always happy that Mr. Hire goes first because he usually expresses what I'm thinking more eloquently than I could. So <laughs> I, I support pretty much everything he said. I'm also very excited about this program. And I thank Mrs. Mahoney and Dr. Ryan and your entire staff for helping me put this together. Um, I had a gut feeling, of course, when COVID started that it was going to be our Title I schools that were going to suffer the most. Um, and now we have, as Mr. Ayer said, we have some data that supports that unfortunate conclusion. And I absolutely support the allocation of extra resources to those schools. Um, you know, part of what we do as a school board is to allocate resources where we think they'll be most effective, and I certainly think that this plan uh, does that. The, the one caution in explaining this to the public, I think, and, and I fully support Mrs. Mahoney's goal to have all of our elementary schools kind of consistent. I think it, we need to understand, though, that that consistency means bringing those lower schools up, not meeting in the middle somewhere, and that we will continue to add resources to all the elementary and all the schools, in fact, 
Um, and that's the goal at the end of the five years or whatever period of time it is. But I'm excited. I thank you again, and I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, and, and to that end, I think our community needs to hear, our, our high-performing buildings will be higher. And, and more exciting than that is all the research supports that when you raise the tide of all of our students in the elementary, the limits of their success and their opportunities for all kids in secondary go up. If you think about it, when they mix together in one middle school, junior high, and high school, teachers teach the students in front of them, not to the book. When the students have a higher collective capability and caliber, everybody benefits. Everybody achieves more. And that's proven. I'm not sure it sounds good, but it actually works. And that goes in the terms of AP classes and access. When we talk about an access to one of our, for our students at one of our Title I buildings in reading and math in third grade, that translates immediately five, six years later to their eligibility. Can they take advantage of the AP and IB classes, right? And I can tell you, if they're not getting it in elementary, they're sure not as taking advantage of all the wonderful things that we have at Clarkson High School. And then, right, one step beyond, and then out in the world. And that's kind of the true, the true ultimate test. Thank you, Mr. Newman. Madam President. Zegan. Um, thank you um, for allowing me to um, address um, our administration. So a couple thoughts came to mind um, as I listened also to Mr. Heyer and also Mr. Need. Um, so we talked about $2.633 million over five years. So some of the things that uh, the board always struggles with is the allocation of resources and how do we how do we really get our payback out of that? We're investing in our kids and their minds. The first thing I think um, is clarifying that this is over five years, so that's about five and a quarter million dollars per year. Where will that come from? What will we not do, or will there be additional federal funding from COVID dollars? But I think part of that um, answer needs to not only come to the board, but also you know, some kind of communication to our community. I also think that um, things like when I heard some of these kids are not doing well because they're struggling with technology, for instance. Mm -hmm. So how does that integrate into the plan? And can we get, um, if we say we're, I'm gonna make up a number. Suppose we're, we're helping a thousand kids and that five and a quarter million is we're targeting for those thousand kids in our community. Can we as a subgroup, without identifying these kids, really see what it is that we're doing at that subgroup level and not only their performance data, but talk about some of the other things that are impacting them, like technology um, and um, maybe some of the outcomes of, again, without identifying our, our students, some of the things that we're doing from a social emotional support standpoint. So what I'm thinking there is when we are looking for additional staff, are we hiring people that look like these students in this subgroup? Will there be people who are bilingual, for instance, if we have a few children that are just really struggling with um, English as their second language? So, um, and yes, family interventions, things like that. Again, the, we don't want to be identifying these students, but what we do need to do, to Mr. Heyer's point, is go down maybe one or two more levels to understand, like we did with the strategic plan. Mm -hmm. Understand a little bit more deeply what it is we're really doing so that we can speak to it publicly, but also um, I think that helps our, our community understand, and nobody gets too, um, I think upset over $2.6 million, what we really should be talking about is over five years we're investing this, and maybe it's not equal increments. And what are we gonna change in funding and investment once we get that first set of data? So um, I don't need all these questions and comments answered tonight by any means, but I do think going down another level or two um, and understanding really what are we investing in, how are we gonna pay for it, and how does that help all the different things that we know are out there that our kids need? Um, and maybe monitoring that subgroup specifically. That's Thank exactly you. what we plan to do. And if you think about perspective, and I, I kind of swim in this stuff all day long. So if the community get a perspective that Clarkson Schools is roughly a $100 million operation per year, and we're talking about in the neighborhood of 2.6 million, I mean, it's really 2.6% of the entire budget. And we're, we're gonna revitalize and reform what we're doing. So I guess the challenge I would put out there is how can't we be doing it 
and we need to find a way somehow within what we're doing. Uh, but as uh, hopefully uh, Ms. Rogers can alert to get to, you know, we do have some, some strong supports this year going to next year for um, federal money and state money that will be line item and tag to this. So then just real quickly then, is it 2.6 per year or is that it's over? It's 2.6 per year. Okay. All right. Do you, do you want to just wait? I figured with our next presentation being about COVID funding, yeah. can we just address all the money maybe and any financial questions with our yeah, second, we'll wait, with our we'll second wait, presentation? It's just that the slide says year. total investment 2.633600. Right. Okay. Okay. So that's, I think, even more important than that we need to really look at what are we talking about over the next five years. Okay. And um, the board always struggles when it comes down to budget. How, you know, are we hurting anyone else when we're helping someone else, right? Nobody wants to be in that position. So that's where I'm coming from. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate your comments. Ms. McGinnis? So none of my questions are meant to um, say that I don't support the plan because they're far from that. As a parent who's lived in this community for over 35 years, I've been waiting to get to this conversation <laughs> for a long time. Um, I can remember my early days on this board, Barry Bomier and myself saying, but what about, <laughs> and we're talking about those what abouts right now. And so I'm so glad to be having this conversation. One of the things I'd like to ask some questions about, I, I guess I want to call them all challenges, because I don't want to use the word problems, and I don't want to use any other derogative word of any sorts that uh, sends a negative message. But um, challenges being 31 teachers, potentially, even if they're all current Clarkson teachers, moving from a classroom environment to either a a coach or a literacy person puts a gap in the classroom that I see the need for a strong preventative prevent, uh, a professional development plan and coaching plan for the potential new teachers that come into the classroom because we be, need to be as mindful about those children in the classroom that um, this plan is not specifically addressing or touching and to make sure that the um, caliber of the day-to-day -day classroom environment doesn't drop because of what we're at, what we're intending to do of course is increase that um, i'm interested to know how this looks on a day-to-day -day basis is this a push in a pull out how does this look for those students who are on an iep um, with learning disabilities lds or students with significant discrepancies or other forms of delayed um, academic achievements. And um, let me see what else I have here. Um, do, 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 do these interventionists, and well, mostly the interventionists, have a room in the building that these children and these coaches, or interventionists, are not sitting in the hallway on the floor working to work with these students to bring them up to grade level. Um, I just. I just see that if we're going to put this, if this program is a A-plus caliber program, which I believe it to be, I want these students to have an environment that meets the needs of them and not put them into the, into the hallway as if they're mm -hmm. discarded. <laughs> and, and just as a high level, and I'll have Ms. Mahoney also comment on it, part of the beauty of how this works in a systemic fashion is we're putting our teachers that we, that we find that, we, that are pure examples of excellence out of the classroom as coaches. And if you look at bringing new teachers in right into an environment that's going to be probably, in many cases, more supportive than their university experience and student teaching and other type of things, we're immediately bringing to bear the experience of our, our staff and some teachers who I think even what might have retired that are coming back in to be that mentor, to be that support. Because a lot of times, I think we know that in, in, a, in a structure, and this is where it touches special ed, that we want 90% of our students in a classroom environment to be successful. They should be. They shouldn't be pulling them out to be fixed. They're not broken. They need to be educated in the classroom with their teacher. And when you find that a handful of students don't do well or are struggling in a class, in the past it's been, teacher, figure it out. That's what you do. And, rea and the reality is, in the, in the scope of their entire classes, they might not have the ex expertise. They might have a blind spot. They might have other challenges where they're not reaching that group of students. The coach is literally that person in the room that's helping them not only improve their practices, but real time, 
the students in their classes and where the gaps are and what as a teacher can I use? What tools do you have to help me to be those students to be successful? And when you have that 10%, once you hit that 90, and none of our buildings had 90% success rates in students, so we have room to grow in the classroom, that's where you have the, the pull out, you have the, the multitude of different interventions that are out there that can be applied. And it's not just the interventionist. I'd mind everybody in our, in our board and community remember, there's also instructional aids, mm -hmm. but in the past, that was kind of the resource that we leaned on, and they're a great bunch. But having a certified teacher in the role to help direct and do the interventions directly, the research tells me you get more bang, you know, long term, you get, a, you get a stronger effect. Albeit on top of that, if we were able to get that 90% in the classroom and we support with, with those on the spot interventions along the way, districts that have executed this successfully find the numbers of special ed students goes down. Absolutely. And the reason is, is that we were able within the systems before labeling a disability, not that there's not a disability there, we were able to mitigate it in a way in a classroom environment or with those direct supports that it wasn't required. So kind of the two part strength is that idea of diverting special education and also using the strength of your own teacher core to really indoctrinate and bring forward your whole next crop of teachers, mm -hmm. which both those elements is beautiful and then at the end, you know, we talk about finances. Our special ed programs are extraordinarily um, expensive in terms of ratio of students to actual supports and any time that we can get in and, and lower the number which right now hovers around 20% in Clarkston not a shame but looking at that it seems very high to me that you know where we can interject and lower that number that is money that then can reinvest and, and help support everything from those current projects that we have with federal money start as it wanes out and everything from salary and everything else that we want to do for our, our staff and our district long term. Great question. And, and I, I appreciate that because um, I think that that I think all of us as board members, of course, as administrators know that if we can prevent a child from slipping below their academic grade year, that we're going to reduce our special ed costs. Absolutely. Okay. I don't know that necessarily in that paradigm, all our community understands that because if they understand that, then they have no problem understanding that we need to put our money where the money needs to be and not just give every building X amount of money. So the premise of understanding that is not one that I think as a community, everybody has been able to grasp because maybe not everybody has a child in, in special ed for whatever the reason may be. But a child in special ed needs more it only makes sense that therefore you have to spend more because they need more. One of the last things I want to say, other than the fact that when the money comes, I want to talk about the money, is I once had an administrator who told me that when you have a program and the program is funded with some money and, you, and the end result of the program is that the reason for the program will no longer exist because you fixed all the problems, I'm waiting for that same thing to happen here. <laughs> Thank you. I can't wait. And I just want to say one thing about um, hiring 30 teachers. We're going to be very mindful. I mean, that is larger than a staff, you know, at, at some of our buildings. And so we're very mindful that we can't deplete a building. This is internal and external posting. We do believe that Clarkston is a very appealing district. And so we're going to be looking at a whole pool of talent as we look at this. And this is team. This is not hierarchy, right? We don't have teacher, coach, interventionist. We are working as one united team. I believe our interventionists are gonna influence our coaches. I believe our coaches are gonna influence teachers. I believe teachers can influence intervention. I mean, this is gonna be constant, but to come in terms of our MTSS process, to look at data, to see how kids are performing, and to make adjustments as necessary around instruction, around interventions, it's gonna be a home run for kids. And that is my goal, is that we can kind of, you know, no longer have some of these programs because our kids are doing so successfully. And, so. and Mrs. Mahoney, we want to hire experienced folks in these positions, right? I mean, we, we've, we've had that as a, you know, kind of marching orders as we've gone up and staffed our coaching positions and things. I, I think that's a key differentiator because I'm aware, like, there are districts in other areas that they, they, they try to hire new teachers because they're less expensive and and that seems completely counterintuitive because i mean we have some great people internally there's great people elsewhere that let's get people that have the experience 
And then I think too, what you just said about the sort of teaming model of clearly there'll be t folks assigned within a building, but as we've looked at our technology folks and our literacy folks, right, they work collectively across the whole district. And if we need to target a certain area, I mean, we can, we can move and morph and Always. adjust and yep. target. And, and, and I think, I mean, that's how the real world works. You know, it, it, it's not siloed off to where I'm working in my department and if that other department needs help, I can't jump in there, right? We don't work that way in, in the, 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 I'll say real world. You know, I think using that sort of ongoing embedded professional development, coaching, mentoring, you know, targeted model, I think, I think that's huge. And the data, the data research backs it up. Now we want to hire the best for these positions, 100% the best. Absolutely. And the cool thing, comparatively, when we had these non-load bearing things, it supports before is I don't know if we had the right mindset of like a goal. Like what you know, this team is not only working as a team to support classrooms, but they want to bring their building. They know where they want to land. And that's a beautiful thing when you let people go to work and you don't stand above them, but you provide them the right tools to get the job done. It's exciting. And I think about you know, that these people will be embedded in a building and be part of that building's culture. And as you said, Dr. Ryan, each of these buildings, as we've all come to know them, you know, have their own culture. And so uh, I, they'll be a right fit for these experienced teachers and the experienced coaches, you know, with, with each of these buildings. I mean, it really is exciting to put the right people in the right positions in the right place. Mrs. Crane, Mrs. Catalina, please. Um, well, being an educator myself, I fully understand all of this and the data and why you're doing this, and I'm in complete support of this. The only question I had, which a bunch of you had, was how this was going to get funded, because um, 2.6 mil is, that's a lot over, you know, year after year after year. But it is exciting. Um, I like that in two years, you know, you're gonna present data that shows, you know, the goals that these kids have, you know, gone from where they're at currently right now back to where they were in 2019 you know with this with these interventions and these coaches helping them um, being in the world of special ed and just knowing how students work I don't think that this program is going to go away in five years I think that this is something that should actually continue to happen year after year after year because once these kids you know get through the high school we're still going to have kindergartners and first graders coming through that are still going to need this special help. They're still going to need these coaches. Mm -hmm. They're still going to need these interventionists. So it's, it's really setting the precedent that, you know, any families that move into Clarkson, we're going to give their child the support that they need in literacy and in math to be a successful, you know, Clarkson student. And, you know, by the time that they get to the high school or they get to the middle school or they get to the junior high, you know, the students are all at a more at a more consensus level where, you know, it's, the teachers can teach at a higher level. So this is just super exciting, but I am funding, you know, where do we get that kind of money from, so. Okay, well, before we get to the funding um, presentation, which is next, uh, I do get the benefit, I guess, of going last and so many of the things I had written down, my colleagues touched on. I would say the only thing that uh, went through my mind uh, was the element of, of trauma because I know some of our buildings, particularly North Sash, has invested so much time and so many resources over the last few years of studying trauma and its effects. And so I just wondered how that sort of threads through this because it really does touch not only on all of our subgroups, but really on all of our students and many of our families, regardless of subgroup status or achievement status, the impact of trauma and how that can or you know, can impact learning. And so where do you see that sort of hitting this plan, I guess. I know Mrs. Puzio is here as, as well. I think it has a huge social emotional impact as well. So is that, I don't think it's a subgroup necessarily, but where do you see that Im impacting? You know, and I think we need to come back to the strategic plan in terms of whole child and supporting um, emotional. The social emotional therapy or um, interventionists will aid in terms of behavior and trauma. We will continue the professional learning to be trauma informed, especially with any new hires. And as we look at um, new people in place in terms of the cultures of our buildings, we are not going to forego this learning. This is still very important to us and we, we're not giving up on it. Good. Thank you. 
And I think several of our, my colleagues expressed the concerns about um, just the addition of staff when we hear day after day in the media um, concerns about teachers and about, um, you, know, you know, I guess a hardship in finding teachers and concerns about teachers wanting to leave the profession. And here we are opening, opening so many new positions and not wanting to move them out of the classroom and create the concerns that Mrs. McGinnis mentioned. But I thought your point, Mrs. Egan, was well taken as, as well, that if part of this is targeting different subgroups, given um, some of the concerns we heard from our community at our last meeting, that I think there's a real opportunity to make sure that those subgroups see themselves represented in a lot of these new positions and these people that will be working directly with them. And we, I think we talk, have talked, started talking more about creating that sense of safety, that sense of belonging for all students in Clarkston. So I thought that was a, a point well taken. I can't thank you enough for this. We, I feel like as a board, have been talking about this since before COVID. And I know when we had a workshop on it, I don't know, it feels like forever ago, 16 months ago or so, we were very excited to start getting into this work. And of course, like everything else, it came to a grinding halt. And so to pick this back up again, uh, to make significant investment, which will now turn uh, our attention to in terms of how we're going to fund it and you know in terms of a lot of other things it, it just feels like we're really really starting to turn the corner from this being the only thing we have to talk about and, and talk about what's really really important as a school district and as a board so thank you dr ryan thank you miss mahoney this is a tremendous amount of work and amount of thought that's gone into this we appreciate it thanks president horse and just even a, a, a couple quick thoughts to end the timing of this is critical this is the front end of our budget cycle that will end the last meeting in June. And as many districts are, I want to say, doing justice by licking their wounds and, and trying to manage the last phase of COVID, timing of this is critical. As I look at the Mr. Lucido in the audience, he'll tell you, we need to get the best and brightest in Clarkston. How do we do that? We go on the offensive now. When everybody else is trying to pick up the pieces, we're not simply looking at narrowing gaps. What you heard tonight was, we want to narrow gaps and then some as, as, a, as a several year in front of us approach. And to do that, we're going to have to be aggressive to start posting those positions sooner than later as part of this planning. Tonight, as far as the finances, is kind of step one. You see there's some major buckets of money. That's going to re require another meeting on top of this to kind of look at the intricacies. Because if you look at just the amount that we've increased fund equity in the last 12 months at the end of the last fiscal year, was roughly $3 million. So we were managed to into the bank, and we're going to have enough money to spend forward into this year to cover this with federal money, as you're going to hear. We're going to need, at some point, if we bankroll several years of this equivalent amount, right, into fund equity, we have to be prepared to look at it as an offensive that we're doing to then get back to 2019 fund equity over a couple of years. You know, think ways that we were able to save, now is the time to invest. And I, and I really like to go on to the offensive. I don't like to be on my heels. I like to be on my toes. I think it's part of what Clarkson's about. It's kind of an American thing. It just feels good to be pushing forward. So tonight is just kind of a primer of that to understand it because the array of multiple um, federal initiatives that have come forth have been, are fairly complex. And I'm not trying to confuse, but just more of just give you a, a flavor of it. And then we're going to come back uh, with both uh, Ms. Rogers and Mr. Lucido to kind of look at the business end of it as we get into budget. I just don't want to leave that off the table as far as expectations. M so. Mrs. Horst? Yes, sir. To, w one historical thought as we close this conversation before we move on to budget is one of the things Mrs. McGinnis mentioned about you know how we kind of used to do things and how we looked at things like not in the very distant future right I mean our mantra was same field trips for every student you know and and, right. and you know when you you Mrs. Mahoney put up the you know specifically a field trip bullet up there it was kind of refreshing because why should every kid get the same field trips you know they're all different you know, they come from different places. There's different things that go on. We want to give kids the opportunities that they need. You know, why are we, why are we wasting certain kids' time going on a field trip where they've been there 10 times already? They don't need to go again. Um, I think targeting that and sort of breaking that mold of, like, every building needs the same thing. Every building needs the same experiences, the same opportunities, the same class sizes, the same field trips. Like, just getting out of that, you know, where we were maybe 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, we're... we're We've moved so far beyond that, and I think it's really important to understand, you know, for our community to come along with us in that conversation. That, that's huge. You know, that, that's a, a big deal. And, and my final thought was um, more for the board of, as we look at all the things that, that Mrs. Mahoney presented and that we've worked on here, I mean, awesome. 
what, what I think potentially is missing as I look around the room here, I, I, I don't know that I could put you exactly in what school you belong to, but I, I feel like we're underrepresented when it comes to the schools we're targeting for board representation. And I think if, if we put a little asterisk next to that thought and maybe if we could do a retreat this summer of some kind, maybe a outdoor retreat or something to uh, you know uh, have some conversations that we haven't had as far as goals and what we want to do as a board in the future, that may be something of how do we recruit some folks that are that are living this? You know, I mean, I, I, I am, am, think we need to have that view represented. And as I've served on different things with MASB and have different perspectives around the state, I think that's really, really, really valuable because I don't know that I'll say we could, we could even empathize enough to put ourselves in, the, in a position of what, you know, certain parents and families, you know, that we need to serve are, are, are dealing with. And I think that's really important at this level. It's certainly not something the administration could rep can recommend to us, um, but something we have to take the initiative on. If we're going to recruit or target or suggest or, you know, make our board inclusive and welcoming um, for some of those representations. I don't know how we do that, but that was a thought I had as we're going through this and I'm looking around the room. Okay. I think that's a piece that, you know, we could talk about in the future. All right. Thank you. All right, we'll turn it right over then to Mrs. Rogers for uh, our next presentation, 5.2, COVID funding plan. Unless Dr. Bryan wanted to introduce. Nope, that, the introduction is this kind of uh, really hopefully takes some of the mystery out of the buckets that we're looking at. Here's a little bit to the magnitude. Now that you have a number in your mind uh, and knowing that what we're gonna need to push forward to start to build that understanding and then we're gonna come back at it meeting after meeting until we have this approved and our budget approved and on our way. Ms. Rogers. Um, this presentation is just to give you an idea of what, what we're doing with all this federal funding and what our plans are for the future for the federal funding that's still coming. Um, this is just, I just wanted, we just wanted to be able to present, I presented this to the uh, cabinet team and it went over real well that we thought maybe it's time for you guys to see. So maybe you can get an understanding of what we've been doing with all this. COVID relief funding. Um, I'm going to start the first slide with how we've what we've what we've spent this year, what funds we've accepted and spent this year. Um, so this year we received about 178,000 in ESSER one funds. That is based on a title formula. We get that based on a title formula. And um, what we spent it on was. Uh, maintaining two North Sashawa elementary teachers so we could maintain their class sizes for them. And then we also um, paid for an instructional aid at Pine Nam. That money was main, was specifically for the title building. So that's how we spent the 178. And then we um, found out in August that we were gonna get almost 3 million in COVID relief funding. That's a different bucket of funds. Um, and this is not as restricted as the ESSER one was, but we still have these like 15 bullet points of how we can spend the money. And so this is um, with a lot of discussions with MDE and I've sh I shared in September some ideas with the auditors because they're going to be the ones in the end that are going to audit this to make sure we spend it correctly. These are the items we came up with and it was mainly just to get um, it was to spend it on stuff we've been spending it on this year and the extra stuff that we had to spend it on for COVID relief items. So a majority of our summer was, has been spent by teachers, administration, implementing and getting ready for uh, distance learning, uh, the Clarkson virtual school that had to be implemented and created. So you're allowed to use the fund for development and implementation, professional development of the, those items. You're not allowed to spend it on ongoing costs, but you're allowed to spend on development and implementation. So our teachers spent um, the end of their summer getting, obviously getting ready for opening school as distance learning and virtual. So we put in our 910 payroll for all our um, 
teacher staff and their support, the supports that work for them. And then our central office administration, uh, there were so several central office administrators that we used their summer pay because their entire summer was redirected to getting ready for distance learning in a, a virtual environment and learning in this new environment. Same with the principals, we used a couple of their payrolls. Um, our media techs had to spend their uh, several weeks of their summer <coughs> distributing for our one-to-one -one technology and, re and distributing technology for uh, our distance learning, our virtual, all the new COVID learning. So their payrolls have been charged. Um, all the purchase, uh, all the PPE equipment, we're up to 400,000 almost this year that we've already spent on PPE equipment. So that's an item you're allowed to spend it on. Um, we redirected one of our positions to be a COVID coordinator, to coordinate all this all the testings, all the um, collaborations with the health department, all those items. Um, every time we have a sub-teacher, sub we have to call in because there was an absence COVID related. That's been allowed to be expended. We redirected our media specialists to doing more COVID duties. You can redirect, if you redirect somebody's functions, you're, one of the things you're allowed to do is redirect their salaries and cost to the funding. The purchase of the Clarkston Virtual Equi cur Curriculum for the, Clarkston, the new Clarkston Virtual was allowed. Um, if we have any unemployment costs, that will be charged. That were due to the COVID. Um, and then hotspots that we provided to our um, community. And any kind of connectivity, any, any items like that, you're allowed to charge if they um, if your community has connectivity issues, uh, technology issues that allow them to continue learning in a distance learning environment. So that's how we spent the three million. Um, and then we found out, but we didn't find out about this funding until I think it was November. We didn't even know about this. And this is um, something we have to be very thankful, I think, to Oakland County for, because this has not been, this is, the, not every county is doing this. I, I don't even, I think it's just a few counties. Oakland County received their own COVID relief funding and then they were able to figure out how to spend it. One of the ideas they, one of the ways they spent their COVID relief funding was to give it to schools. So we found that out in November that we were gonna get, and then that was something that we had to go into Oakland County and apply for, and they awarded us 1.172 million. You can spend it the same way you spent the three million that we received from the state. It's the same funding, it's just from a different, Oakland County was just willing to share theirs with schools. Um, so we spent it on uh, additional teachers that had to be recalled and adding, and we added teachers so we can lower the class sizes for uh, you know social distancing and all those items. Back when you um, approved the budget in June, you, we were gonna do a bunch of teacher reductions. In the end, we didn't because of what happened in the COVID environment. So we were able to recall them and, right. and then even add a few. And we were able to use the Oakland County relief funding for that. We've added, we had to add a technology person and uh, providing staffing for childcare and, and then charging some of the PPE equipment also to here. So that's another bucket we received. And then um, Michigan Association, M-A-I-S-A, uh, was uh, given a rebate. So it was, it was uh, just like filling out a rebate. Like you go to Menards and you fill out a rebate. It's kind of pretty much what I did. Filled out a rebate for uh, all those um, Chromebooks and iPads that we bought for one-to-one. -one. You could turn in and they gave you, I can't remember the exact amount, but they gave you a certain amount per device and it added up to 110,000. But because we purchased all that, those devices from our bond, it was, uh, we just reimbursed the bond. But that's 110 we can spend on the bond, on something in the bond that we wouldn't already be able to. So that was 110. Also, MAISA provided a COVID connectivity fund. Connectivity funding, it's all still part of the CRF bucket, but they also, 
we found out both of these items I think we found out about in like December January but they um, through the Oakland schools provided all schools in Oakland County if you wanted to apply you could and you had to say what you were spending on and we were awarded 44,600 and these are the items that we were able to spend it on it was mainly just you know for connectivity issues so zoom license microphone document cameras the follow resource manager it was items we were going to do anyways so then we were able to move them in to this funding oops thank you i'm not done <laughs> and then uh michigan and then we received another what they called uh covid cost ppe from the state we received this in august of 105 469 also another piece of the covid relief funding this um, is stuff that we bought last school year but we didn't receive the revenue until this year but so we're going to be recognizing the revenue to this year but we were we were allowed to go back into the last school year on ppe equipment that we bought last school year so that's what that's um, going to be accounted for. When you look at all the funding, that is 4.391 million funding this year of one-time funding for this school year, and a bond reimbursement of 110. Because of all this funding and the way we were able to redirect it all, we we you approved a budget, and if, as you remember, that was in deficit of 891,000. When I brought you the amended budget in March 8th, we now have a surplus of 3 million because we were able to redirect all these, like Sean said, to invest, increase our fund equity. So we're, when we start losing this one-time funding, we'll be able to still sustain items, if that makes sense. So now, new COVID funding streams 2021, 22 or beyond. This year we received, we have been notified that we're gonna get federal lesser two funds. If we receive it all, it will be equivalent of 1.4, over a little over 1.4 million. However, because of some political environments going on in the state of Michigan, the governor has vetoed a portion of that. So at this point, only 617,658 has been approved, even though the state has the money. They've only approved that amount. Uh, so that's all we can rely on right now. Hope we should, I would assume, get the 800, but that's what we know right now. Um, this is similar to the ESSER 1 setup. We apply just like we do our title funds. Um, we have till September 2022 to spend it. And it has to be spent on the, like the 15 items of federal allowable expenditures that they have listed. Um, and uh, then the Michigan supplemental funding, which is from the state, is federal funding that has gone directly to the state, and then the state's going to fundle it to us, is 2.443 million. If you've been hearing that we're going to get this 450 per pupil in COVID relief funding, it's the federal, it's the ESSER 2. It's, it gets a little more complicated. It's the, if, your ESSER 2 does not get you to 450. Because some schools, their ESSER 2, because they're a heavily uh, title funded school district, they, their whole ESSER 2 could get them to the 450. So other school districts, it can't get you to the 450. So the state put in another 2.43, and they're calling it a state equalization funding to get us all $450 additional funding. This is all one-time money. So because 1.4 million is not 450, our whole would be the 2443 that they're gonna give us. And we had to submit a very broad plan in our April plan, by April 23rd, a very, very broad plan in that monthly learning plan that you approved. We had to submit a very broad plan in there and basically, and the other, there were these required items, which we met them all. You have, you're required to provide 20 hours per instruction of in-person. You have a monthly COVID learning plan that the board's approving monthly. So all that we met. Um, 
all these two pieces of funding that we those two pieces we pretty much are just going to do the same spend pretty much the same way we spent last year's so that I just went over with you mm -hmm. We're, we'll continue to spend it similar similar ways so that way we don't um, we are redirecting expenses to keep our budget going positive there is an ESSER 3 bucket that um, is there is estimated to be over three million dollars we haven't had to submit anything for that at this point you do have to 2024 to spend it on this is a, where you will see the equity plan getting covered at least for next school year we would be able to cover the equity plan through this so do i have any questions because this is a lot of buckets and a lot of funding and i've been working First, on it all I just, year i just so. want to seal the deal on a little bit of the ideas if you notice that our 2.56 you know 2.6 million dollar plan you know, thinking of what we were able to add to our fund equity last year, looking at better part of two, three other blocks of, of resources that look very similar and possibly a fourth one collectively, you also have to see that we're pivoting this year. And, and Mr. Lucido has been working countless nights with uh, Ms. Rogers, looking at, you know, we had a virtual school that had what, roughly 1,300 students in it. And we pivoted and we created that out of thin air and more than half those students are, are set to return back to, to brick and mortar, probably even more than that. You know, the way that we're restructuring, moving, and, and, and shifting the district is, is dizzy. We've never created a, that kind of capacity in a single year. Now we're actually dismantling it, and repurposing it immediately into our larger plans that we shared tonight. So I don't think it takes much imagination to see that there's definitely some routes that we'll be able to support. Our, our plans for at least a foreseeable future. And I, and I think this kind of sheds hope with a little bit of light. And Ms. Rogers, you did a nice job based on it. It is complicated. And I think our community and our staff should know that this isn't just free money that's coming in that we're doing it. The federal government designed it in a way that, and the state government, they want it to go to what you heard tonight as far as our planning. This is, this is the idea of programs and supports post-COVID. We're just taking it further, right? So I, I like the idea of what we're doing, and we're going to hopefully continue to hit on all cylinders with it. So, And one of the pieces of the ESSER 3, which falls in, I think, to your equity plan, is 20% has to be spent on learning loss, any lo learning loss you've had because of COVID. So that's where I think your equity plan will fall right into it. The $2.6 million of the equity plan is the additional. We I don't know if you remember, but when Nancy was going through, some of her stuff was already in the budget. Like we already have six literacy coaches. We already, you know, we have some of those items already in our current budget. So that plus the 2.6 million should be easily, most of it should be covered by the Sester three funds if that's the way you guys decide to go. That'll get you through next school year. Plus we'll be, hopefully be carrying two years of surplus which Sean's talking can get you now into the future because this obviously is reoccurring costs being paid by one time. So that'll hopefully build, so we're hopefully building our fund equity to at least sustain this equity plan for another year or two with surplus funding, with higher fund equity. So. Um, any questions on the big amounts? Because these are smaller amounts. Anything so far big. while we pause for a moment? on the big buckets it was a lot like I said, a, i've been working on it all year it's a lot i mean that's a lot to keep track of in addition to everything you do for us on a daily basis so thank you so much for detailing yes. that before you move on i know there's more to see i just wanted to stop and just say thank you for that detail so far and i want to throw out there too that with all this extra federal funding is going to cause a lot more auditing a lot more no doubt single audits <laughs> with our auditors we currently only do one single audit a year we're looking at two or three now the auditors are coming out May, 8, 9, May 18th and 19th to start single auditing all this stuff. So what used to be a million, they, now they're going to be auditing six to seven million. So it's going to be pretty intense with the auditors, I think. So just a real quick question. The additional auditing, is that required on just the new federal funds post-COVID, or would that be our entire budget? Or uh, what? what what causes a single audit is any federal funding that you receive over $750,000. So these all, 
group together as one item and they're going to and then mm -hmm. it's, it's like four million and they're going to single audit mm -hmm. that so over 750. so is this like our, our um gosh i can't think of the old acronym but like our special needs federal funding idea yeah ID. idea is yeah, another I one if they single audit okay but they're required to single audit something once every three years so idea was single audited last year so they won't single audit that one for two but i'm years. just saying it's it's a similar setup yes, like what we similar. used to okay as as if, once you receive federal funding of 750 or more of the same bucket of what they consider in covid relief funding they consider one bucket even though it's coming from four different areas mm -hmm. they will single audit that the other item that we will get single audited for sure is nutrition. They haven't audited our food service in a while, and that's well over 752. Our federal funding we get from was what um, did you say? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. The food service food funding. Service. Okay, thank you. The federal funding we get. Right. Because of all these free, we're in. We're gonna. Be, we're gonna be getting a substantial amount of food service yeah. um, money this year from the federal government. So that will be single audited. Mm -hmm. Those are our two main ones, and I don't know if they're going to add. They may add a third, but they're coming out May 18th and 19th, so we'll know more then. But so, so um, these are some other funding streams that are coming. One of them uh, that we are going to try to take advantage of. We already had to submit a very, very broad plan, just more or less, just saying, yeah, we're going to try to go after it. Credit recovery funds up to 550 per pupil. Um, we already run a small credit recovery. This will just hopefully we can reach more kids. And this is for ninth through 12th graders. And then we're going to try to go after the before and after school and then the stipends to teachers and staff. I, had, I think I have slides that tell you a little bit more about each one of these funding pieces that we're going to um, see if we can provide programs for. The first one, the credit recovery funding. You can get up, like I said, up to 550 per pupil. We're hoping to reach 300 ninth through 12th graders. That's what we told them in the plan that had to be submitted by um, April 15th. And you can see the criterias. And then, then, like I said, we had to submit the plan by April 15th. So we're hoping to get some of that funding. Before and after school, that that's up to 25,000 per district. Um, we're going to we're going to try to provide some after school programs um, with the lost learning and um, same same thing. We pretty much just had to tell them that we were interested in maybe this program and meeting the requirements in our April 15th plan. So we'll know more in May and June if we get awarded any of these kind of funds. And then the third, third one is if you provide these programs like credit recovery before and after, you can, you can also apply for 1,000 for each teacher that teaches in those programs or 250 for each support staff that works in these programs. So if we run these programs, we can try to um, get this funds and then you have to turn around and then just pay those teachers and so. so. I have another quick question. Sorry. Sure. Uh -huh. um, so these summer programs, would these be within the boundaries of our district or would that include our virtual students or would we do both? I, I haven't been part of the program development of the credit recovery. It's, it's pretty much from my understanding, because we've always kind of run a credit recovery program, they're going to be providing an opportunity for these students to um, do virtual um, credit recovery. I, I didn't ask it summer. appropriately, I'm sorry. So in district only, yeah. each district would be doing their own summer programming, if any. My question is, would we be accepting students outside of our Clarkston boundary, our district boundary? And it would just be our, the kids It's just that, in district, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah. Because we do have some virtual students that are probably out of district, right? So I'm just curious if we're, how do we accommodate those? These are targeted those? programs for Clarkson kids. We're okay. advertising, we're making sure they're able to sign up, kind of teachers for it, et cetera. Will we do something similar for our virtual program then that touches other students? I'm just curious, or do we not know yet? They would be, I think they would have the same opportunity, especially for part of the program being virtual. They'll be able to take, take part in that okay. as well. 
wow. regards to kids. Yeah, mind you, all school districts around us, everybody's doing this. Right. So you, you, you probably geographically would just go to the closest one or the one that you have the closest contact with. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions or discussion? A lot more to come. All right. So, I have any questions? Um, I think seeing it like this in in a big, I mean, just the overall. I mean, it's an, it's a tremendous amount of money that's coming to us one time. Eventually coming to us. Hopefully and, and coming to us. Has been promised to us. We'll I see. do believe there's potential for more. There yeah. might be more one-time funding as the, you know, they work through these, the legislators work through things, and if the federal government passes some more, any more packages, I don't know, but this is what we know at this point. But it won't surprise me if they don't come up with more next year. But do we remember this is one-time funding, though? One-time funding. All right. I think if I've heard you say anything to us, whether it's been in agenda planning or this format, it's to remind us, especially yes. as we enter budget season, that this is one-time funding. Yes. <laughs> one-time funding. Thank you, Mrs. Rogers. So I'd say as we wrap up our two presentations tonight, which were related, um, trustees, I, I kind of took four big takeaways, I think, as we move forward in, in monitoring um, this equity plan. And so uh, just as, as we continue to move forward with workshops and other items of interest as we continue to dive into this, um, I made note of the idea of, of language and how we can be better equipped to talk about this in our community and what's the right way we describe it. Um, also, the, the financial piece of it and how are we going to talk about not only how we pay for it going forward, but how are we going to quantify the investment, uh, how will we how, we, how are we going to be sort of more granularly engaged in our subgroups and how are we going to track subgroup performance? And then I think finally there was a real interest in um, tracking who we're hiring for all those positions and how we make sure not only of the quality of those folks, but how we're going to uh, just make sure the whole team, uh, that, that we're maintaining the integrity of the whole team, the classroom piece as well as as, or, as the new positions. I think those are kind of the four big takeaways. Did I capture that correctly? Were those kind of the big, big concerns and issues that we want to track going forward? Certainly, if there's any other questions that come up, let me know. But I think as we continue to monitor this plan and we dig a little bit deeper, as Ms. Egan pointed out, those couple layers down, we'll make sure that we continue to, to follow those issues. All right, thank you everyone for the, for the time and engagement tonight. It was kind of nice to dig deep into um, to, to something that actually has to do with learning and outcomes. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll move on to action items. Item 6.1 is approval of personnel changes. May I have a motion, please? I move the Board of Education approves personnel changes as listed on the attached sheets as presented. Support. Any questions or discussion from the board? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. Item 6.2 is approval of agreement with T-Mobile. May I have a motion, please? I move the Board of Education approves the attached agreement with T-Mobile for the staff meal program as presented. Support. Any questions or discussion from the board? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Item 6.3 is approval of superintendent contract. May I have a motion, please? I move that the Board of Education approve the superintendent's contract as presented. Support. Are there any questions or discussion from the board? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. M Mrs. Horst, I, I didn't notice this earlier, but I think we need to change the mister to a doctor. Uh-oh. Oh, no. Sorry about that. Oh, this is in the signature line? In the beginning. Yeah. On, on it. Four. And signature. It's on the signature, too. Shoot. All right. Sorry, Mrs. McLean. Okay. I'm going to make you redo it. Do I need to bring that back or can we approve that with just updating the credential? I, I, I think it's just housekeeping. 
housekeeping. <laughs> Thank I you. I made so the motion, much. and I I'm okay with everyone else. All right. It, it, it's just one letter. Right. It's one letter. Right. The M to the D. All right, Dr. Ryan. Sorry about that. We should have that. We should have that down by now. I think this is just the first time it's come up since since uh, the the news. So I think it's this quite is an the first contract since since he was officially hired. So two years is a is a good time to wait. Thank you for being patient. Item seven is report items. Seven point one is our monthly finance report. We will welcome Ms. Rogers back to the podium. This is um, March of 2021 financial update. Okay, I know I was just in the last board meeting, but this gets us all caught up and right on schedule with our financial updates. Um, this does have the new amended budget in it, so you'll see lots of changes happen here where there might have been some negatives. I think everything is uh, positive now. Um, May, your big one would be the federal revenue. I think we were over 100% before, but now we were able to get all the one-time funding in our budget. So our budget to actual revenue is a 60%. Our budget to actual expenditures is 63%. So we're right on schedule with both. And uh, the fund equity did um, just, it's just more of the timing of getting revenue and getting it all booked. As we have all summer to get everything booked, it just makes it look like our fund equity at this time of year always looks like it's going down a little bit. Um, so that's at 9.8 for the month. So um, you were provided um, all the March financials if you guys have any questions. Are there any questions for Mrs. Rogers on the March financial report? Seeing none. I do want to tell you, and you maybe already you're probably aware of this, but the Senate and the House's budgets came out early la or middle of last week. They weren't a whole lot different than the governor's. They were maybe different buckets in different ways, but in the end, I think this, I don't think they were a whole lot different than what the governor proposed. And uh, the May uh, revenue revenue consensus is May 21st, and then we'll know more. So they are moving along, hopefully with the budgets. Great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Item eight is discussion items. We have none tonight. Item nine is citizen comments. Citizens are welcome to address the board on any topic at this point on the agenda. Let me switch over to our list. At this point, I see one citizen who is requested to address the board. If there is anyone else in our audience who would like to address the board, simply press on the participants button and the raise hand feature. And just a reminder that when we call on you to please state your name and you will have two minutes to address the board. Mrs. McLean, I see one citizen, Ms. Tyra Blanks. Uh, I think you just need, Hi. oh, there we go. We can hear you and we're ready to hear from you. Hi, my name is Tyra Blanks and I live in, um, I'm sorry, the la one of the last means we have to say where we live. I live in Clarkston. Could you, I'm um, oh, sorry, could you just speak up just a touch? Oh, we're going to turn up the computer oh. on our end just a little bit too. Can you hear me now? We can. Yes. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, so I wanted to uh, bring up one thing. I see that we have the tip hotline. Um, I do know that uh, at least my son has used it. Um, one of, first off, I want to say I'm glad we have it and not just for our um, non-white students, but for all of our students, because I believe that white students see and hear things as well and um, don't feel comfortable going and saying things or going to speak to someone. So I do like that idea of them being able to go and report things. However, when you call the line, they immediately ask for your name and your phone number, and they don't let them know that it's optional. So if our students are using it and they want to report something anonymously, we may need to change the way that we uh, word when we're asking them something when they call. Um, my other concern, I, I just a quick question about the subgroup. I kept hearing subgroup when we were speaking about um, the equity plan. It is completely okay to say African-American students, black students, Hispanic students, or students of color. 
if you only refer to those students as subgroups, which is what I think you were doing, you make us feel like we're not a part of the community. And that's just a bit of a house cleaning thing that I think needs to be addressed. Um, you have to refer to those students and not call them subgroup students. Um, and then also the rebate money that I believe that Heidi found, some of that money could be used to um, getting some help when it comes to the diversity, equity, and inclusion in the schools. And when I say diversity, equity, inclusion, I'm not speaking about the um, actual educational course portion of it. I'm speaking about the social and emotional that needs to take place within the district, not only for students, but also for teachers and educators in the um, building as well that need to be you know, educated on how they see things and how they are picking up on some of the things that are going on within the buildings and the hallways. Um, today, one of my sons, he was asked by someone and I appreciate them being concerned, but they asked him if he felt safe. And just a little bit of help for you to go around and ask black and brown students if they feel safe in the buildings, they are not gonna be open to you unless you formed a relationship with them. And so that's what I mean by actually getting an audit being done for the diversity, equity, and inclusion, inclusion of our schools so that everyone learns how to be able to talk to their non-white students so that they can help them to be safe in the buildings and not with doing what we think would be okay and acceptable. And one quick question, and I know my two minutes is almost up. When you put the equity plan together, did you have other people in the room or, were, or was this a room full of white people? See, you have to have a diverse group of people to put a plan together for diversity. I see that there is a plan for an equity and inclusion person, but it's only at the elementary school that is 20% black. But I don't see that position at the other schools. If we can start educating these kids early on about what's acceptable and what is not, we won't have such a mess, just, you know, a mess over at the junior high with a lot of these different slurs and things being thrown around and, and all of those things if we start early. That position needs to be in every building. White children need to be educated too. They should not be left out of this. They are being left out and they need to be included. You guys have a wonderful evening. Great. Thank you so much for your comments. I appreciate it. I'm not seeing anyone else who wishes to address the board. And I know, Dr. Ryan, the tip line. Um, yeah. Do you mind, President? No, Morris? please, Normally, if you want to go ahead. We've shied away from being able to address directly, but it's much more difficult when individuals aren't in the room where I can then approach immediately afterwards or that we can provide clarifying. I appreciate the, the comments in respect to the, the tip line. That's something that we can uh, remedy, and we're really happy that we're able to get that immediately out. And if it wasn't mentioned strong enough, I did mention my presentation. We are. We talk about subgroups that is economically disadvantaged. That's our black students, our brown students, our Hispanic students, our special education students, and all groups that we find in Clarkson have been marginalized in one way or another, academically, socially, emotionally, or within their feeling of safety and welcomeness in our buildings. That is all near and dear to our heart, and we will uh, tackle that with that. Uh, as far as the uh, equity positions, looking at the support, there is an elementary and a secondary uh, position within that. So I believe I hit that and I would love to continue the conversations. I've spoke to Ms. Banks before and our, our team and we look forward to the input. And as far as input in the equity plans, yes, we had both individuals, black and brown, that were in meetings uh, that were part of that equity planning back when we started that. But we still have far to go in a lot of different areas. We look to continue to grow with our community and, uh, moving forward collectively and that includes everyone so thank you Great. thank you dr ryan i see one more person who has indicated their interest in addressing the board wait no went away nope i'm here oh okay um, sorry about that it went, it went from one to the other. Oh, Mrs. McLean is faster than I am. Good for that. Okay, if you could uh, state your full name, please, and you'll have two minutes to address the board. Yep, Mary Skrupski. I'm a teacher um, in Clarkston and a parent. The um, only one thing that I was wondering is if we are looking at the PTOs and the PTCs and the PTAs in Clarkston in this equity plan, 
because um, as a teacher of North Sash, that is one of the biggest struggles for our parents. And I didn't know, I know we've talked about it through the years about bringing them together, but just trying to bring it back to the forefront. That's all. All right, thanks, Mary. Thanks, Mary. And obviously for some of you who are uh, maybe new to attending meetings this way, this typically isn't a format where we can engage in questions and answers back and forth, but I know our administration takes note of all questions and uh, does follow up um, afterward as they can. All right. Seeing no other uh, questions or comments from citizens, we'll move on to information items. Our next Board of Education meeting is Monday, May 10th. 6 p.m. in our same format here in, in person and via Zoom. Uh, I have one more information item for the board. Mrs. McLean uh, informed me tonight that she did not know of any one of us who agreed to be the Oakland Schools designee when it came to the Oakland Schools budget or any of you. Does anyone willingly? Um, oh, is that Mrs. McGinnis? No, I am saying I can do it for you. Oh, Mrs. McGinnis is volunteering without me even. Mr. Hire. Mr. Hire gave the not me sign. Well, great. Mrs. McGinnis has volunteered without me having to make a big plea. Are we going to arm wrestle for it? Oh, okay. There was, she'd take you. Okay. Mrs. McLean, Mrs. McGinnis has generously agreed to uh, take that nice packet from your uh, desk and review the Oakland Schools budget. Thank you so much. And so all that's left on our agenda tonight is item 11, adjournment. May I have a motion, please? Move to adjourn. Support. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. No one is opposed. The motion carries. We are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Good night.